Not many books stay in print for over 200 years, but I guarantee I'll find this one here. The Federalist Papers, still going strong since 1788, but it started as a propaganda campaign. The Constitution was written in 1787 because Americans were unhappy with the first Constitution they'd made, the Articles of Confederation. Under the Articles, the states had supreme power. State laws were capricious and oppressive, and Congress could not raise taxes to pay the nation's debts. But many Americans thought the new Constitution had gone too far. Was the new federal government too powerful? Why was there no Bill of Rights? The battle was fought out in the newspapers. For a little country, the United States had a lot of them. New York City had five. Robert Yates, a New York judge who had walked out of the Constitutional Convention in protest halfway through, began a series of articles criticizing the Constitution. Alexander Hamilton, another New Yorker who had signed the Constitution, thought its friends needed to respond. He planned a rival series of essays and found two co-authors, another New Yorker, diplomat John Jay, and a Virginia congressman, James Madison, who, like Hamilton, had signed the Constitution. Journalists in those days used pseudonyms, often historical. Yates signed himself Brutus after a founder of the Roman Republic. Hamilton and his team signed themselves Publius, after another founder of the Roman Republic. No one was going to pull rank on them. Publius's pace was frantic. Each Federalist essay was 2,000 words long. A modern op-ed is about 750. They appeared four times a week. Madison described the grind. It frequently happened that whilst the printer was putting into type the first parts of an essay, the following parts were still under the pen. On top of everything, John Jay got sick early in the process, throwing most of the work onto Hamilton and Madison. The complete set wound up being 85 essays. Hamilton wrote 51, Madison 29, and Jay 5. These are the most important. Americans must not fight among themselves, and they must be strong enough to repel the attacks of others. Is it not time to awake from the deceitful dream of a golden age, and to realize that we are yet remote from the happy empire of perfect wisdom and perfect virtue? A closer union among the states would stimulate the American economy. The veins of commerce in every part of the country will be replenished from a free circulation of the commodities of every part. Most republics in history had been small, but if you extend the sphere of a republic, as the Constitution would, by nationalizing politics, you make it less probable that a majority will feel a common motive to invade the rights of other citizens. The Constitution was complex, with a president, two houses of Congress, a judiciary, and 13 states. But complexity was another guarantee of liberty. We have so contrived the interior structure of the government that its several constituent parts may keep each other in their proper places. Under the Articles of Confederation, there was no executive. 
the Constitution called for a president because energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of good government. Not all Publius's arguments were good. Number 84 tried to explain why the Constitution needed no Bill of Rights, and number 54 defended the Three-Fifths Clause, which boosted the power of slave states. A Bill of Rights was added by the First Congress, and the Three-Fifths Clause was eliminated, along with slavery, only by the Civil War. The Federalist Papers didn't try to answer every question for all time. They were written to help ratify the Constitution, and in New York, where they were first published, and in Virginia, where they were reprinted, they did. What's amazing is how valuable and interesting they still are today. The Supreme Court cites the Federalist Papers in decisions. Not bad for a collection of old op-ed pieces.